Hey everyone, we will do lab exam to exercise today. It is going to be over labs, experiments 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. For the best results of this exercise, please repeat lab experiments 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14 as many as possible before taking this exercise. Prepare some pieces of papers, uh, pen and pencil to write your answer. There will be two or three seconds after each question to write your answer before the answer key is given and explained. Remember, you can always pause the video if you need more time. After finish the exercise, check your answer, how many are correct and how many are incorrect. Repeat the process until you get 100% correct answer and make sure that the 100 correct answers are based on your knowledge, not from guessing. It is very likely that you will get a very good score on your lab exam two if you follow this instruction correctly okay we start with number one all the followings are names that can be used to describe the major organs of the digestive system except so looking for except a b c or d Okay, digestive system can be also called as digestive tract. So this one is correct. Uh, intestinal tract, it is not correct because intestinal actually only ref refer to the uh, intestine, not the whole digestive system. So this is the one that is incorrect. Alimentary canal is also correct gastro or gi tract is also correct so the answer is the intestinal tract it is not another name for the digestive system the gi tract gastrointestinal tract is also called digestive tract or the blank canal a b c or D. Okay, of course, GI tract is not birth canal, is not auditory canal, it is not hepatic canals. The correct is alimentary canal. The esophagus connects which of the following structure? A, B, C, or D. Okay, to know this, you have to know the sequence of the GI tract. Okay, it starts from the mouth. Okay, so mouth, from the mouth, the food will go to the throat or pharynx. Okay, and then it will go to the esophagus. And then it will go to the stomach. And it will go to the small intestine. And it's continue as a large intestine. or colon, that's another name for the large intestine. And then rectum, okay? And then the undigested part of the food will out from our body through the anus. Okay, so these are the sequence of the GI tract. From the mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum and then ends. Now the question is, which uh, the esophagus connect which of the following 
structure. So the structure between esophagus. Okay, so this esophagus is over here. The structures that are connected by the esophagus will be pharynx and the stomach. So look for that answer. Pharynx and stomach. So C is the correct answer. Which of the following produce saliva? A, B, C, or D? So this one should be easy answer. Saliva produced by salivary glands. So all of this salivary gland is located in the mouth. Okay, so we have three pair of salivary glands the parotid glands, sublingual glands, and then submandibular glands. What is the function of saliva? What is the function of saliva? A, B, C, or D. So saliva, mostly it contains water, and there's an enzyme is called the amylase okay, that digests carbohydrates. Okay, or amylum. Okay, so amylums is another name for starch. So this amylase digests the starch or amylum into smaller carbohydrates like maltose and then become glucose. Okay, so this, the function of saliva, it has enzyme that digests carbohydrates. Salivary amylase, so this is the name of the enzymes, digest the A, B, C, or D. So we already mentioned that this salivary amylase digests amylum, and amylum is the same as a starch, and starch is a carbohydrate. So this should be the Which enzyme digests carbohydrates? Okay, this is another question, similar questions. So the answer will be the amylase. Which enzyme digests proteins? A, B, C, or D. Of course, we will not choose amylase. We know this is car digest carbohydrate. Lipase from the name. This one digests light, uh, lipids. Okay, the name is telling you it's digesting lipids. Nucleosides, this one digests the nucleotide like DNA, okay, part of DNA and RNA. So this is not the answer. This is for lipid, this is for carbohydrate. Okay, so the correct answer will be A, pepsin. Usually the enzymes that digest protein and with IM mostly, eh? like trypsin, okay, chymotrypsin. Eh? So this digests carbohydrate, I mean proteins. With enzyme digest lipid or fat, lipid. A, B, C, or D. So it's telling you here. So the enzyme that digests lipid is called lipase. A is actually refer to enzymes. So lipase digests lipids. With enzyme digests DNA or RNA, 
So we know this is digesting protein, carbohydrates, lipid. So this should be the answer. Sometimes eh, there is enzyme called the DNAase, digest DNA. There is also RNAase, digest RNA. What is a simple test to detect a presence of simple sugar? A, B, C, or D. So carbohydrate like starch is a, a polysaccharide. Okay, so this polysaccharide a complex sugar. It contains thousands of sugars. It will be digested into smaller or simple sugar like maltose, glucose. Okay. The enzyme that digests this stuff is the amylase. Remember that. Okay. Then we can actually check whether amylase digests the stuff or not by looking for the results. So if we have positive results, if there is maltose, if we put benedic uh, reag uh, reagents, then it will change color from blue to orange. So this is positive result. So the test is called a benedic test. Which color chain represents a positive reaction for the presence of simple sugar, okay, like maltose, okay, glucose okay, in the solution using Benedict test, A, B, C, or D. Already explained that before, it will go from blue, so blue is negative, to orange color. And orange is positive. If this orange, it means that that solution contains this maltose or glucose. Okay. So if you see this picture over here, the one that has maltose, which is the middle tube, it has orange color. The other two, like the one that only have water, it does not change the color. It's become uh, still or stay blue. Starts, it is also blue because the starch is not digested into maltose yet. So this is negative, negative, and this is positive result, mean it has simple sugar. In the lab experiment, tube four had starts in it, just like tube one and two, but did not show reaction with genetic reagents. Why not? Okay, choose maybe the reason why it is not turned orange. A, B, C, or D. Okay, so if tube one, two, and four, All of them has starts, starts, starts. Okay. With adding the Benedict reagents over here, it say that the tube number four stay blue, so it's negative result. But the other tube over here, it changed color into orange, positive result. So what is the probable reason why? Of course, it means that tube number one and two, it has maltose. Okay. Tube number four, no maltose. Now you have to know what is the possible reason why there is maltose over here, because there is enzyme.
that they just start into molecules. Okay, so the possible reason why tube number four do not change color because in tube number four it did not have the enzyme, the amylase. Therefore, it stay blue. Okay, that's the most possible reason. In the lab experiment, tube three did not have starts or amylase in it. Why it did not show positive reaction? Uh, why it did show, okay, it's positive reactions over here. So the color changed to orange with the Benedict reagents. Why? What is the possible, the main possible reason for this one? So we have tube number three. It say it has maltose. Okay, no enzyme. Okay, so when we put Benedict, of course, it will change the color directly because maltose is the one that give positive result with the Benedict test. Okay, so it means that the Benedict reagent reacts with this maltose. That's the correct answer. Okay, there is no pH buffer over here. It will not react with water. Maltose is broken down into starch. It is incorrect because the starch is actually digested into maltose. Okay, so the correct answer will be C. In which pH salivary amylase will work best? So just remember amylase. The first amylase is actually uh, this is in saliva in our mouth, and our mouth is neutral pH. It has neutral pH. So salivary amylase will work best at neutral pH around seven. Amylase was shown to work best at pH of seven, which is neutral pH, uh, in comparison of pH two, which is acidic. Okay, so in the stomach, yeah, we have pH 2. So this is very acidic in our stomach. What do we know about the function of salivary amylase within the stomach? So what do we think? A, B, C, or D? Of course, uh, amylase will not work in the stomach. It's actually amylase will be broken down in the stomach. There, there will be no salivary amylase in the stomach okay amylase will function normally is not uh, because the ph is very acidic amylase will function in the stomach better even no amylase won't function in the stomach very well so that's correct okay it will not function in acidic condition What substance in the stomach causes its low pH? So our stomach, the pH is around two, right, which is acidic, a acidic. So which one's gonna be causing this acidic condition is from acid, a, which is the hydrochloric acid or HCl. So our stomach, cell is actually producing this hydrochloric acid and causing the stomach juice become acidic. Which of the following digestive function involves the passage of nutrient from alimentary canal? Okay, mostly the intestine okay, into the blood. Okay, so our digestive system digests the food into nutrient. Okay, and these nutrients will be go from intestine to the blood. So what do you call that process from intestine to the blood? Ingestion? No, ingestion is eating. So this is not the answer. Digestion is digestion of bigger molecule into nutrient. So this is not the answer for this question. 
absorptions. Yes, okay. defecation is when we release the undigested food uh, from our body. So this is not the answer. So the correct answer will be the absorption. So our blood will absorb the nutrients from our alimentary canal, especially intestine. What is the name of the volume of air moved in or out of the lung during the quiet respiratory cycle? So we are moving from digestive system to respiratory system here. Okay? Remember, this is part of your lab experiment. What do you call the volume of air move in, out during quiet respiratory cycle? So this is during uh, relaxation. There are about 500 millimeter air will be moved in and out from our lungs. So what that process called? Uh, vital, vital is the whole uh, air in the lung. So this is not the answer. Residual means the air that stay in the lung after we are breathed out. This is not the answer. In spiritual reserve volume, this is when we really inhale a lot of air. So this is also not the uh, uh, answer. This is forced inhalation, not the answer. So the correct answer will be the tidal volume. This is during the uh, normal breathing. It's called tidal volume, which is here in the middle. Okay. So this tidal volume over here, about 500 milliliter air move in and out from our lungs. This is normal, relaxed breathing. Which of the statements correctly describe the vital capacity? Vital capacity. A, B, C, or D. Okay, look at this picture. Is part of your lab experiments. Okay? So the vital capacity is from here to here. Okay? So this is the air that can be exhaled okay, after a full inhalation. So this is what we call the uh, vital capacity in your lab, it is measured as PVC. Okay? So PVC, this is the measurements of vital capacity. Okay, all the air that can be exhaled after a full inhalation. So it's measured as PVC in your lab experiment. A patient who has low VEV 1% and low VEF 25 to 75 in spirometric test should be diagnosed with what condition? A, B, C, or D. Okay. Okay, look at this picture. So this is obstruction, which is, is going down. Okay, so in your uh, graph from the lab experiment, it will be look like this. Okay, so this over here is going down, but the vital capacity is similar with the normal uh, person, which is, let's say this is four liter, this is also four liter. This is this picture over here showing there is an obstruction obstructive uh, respiration or breathing. Right? Like people with asthma usually will show this picture of a graph. Okay, so the figures show a spirometry test results based on the size, shape, and approximate vital capacity in this diagram, this patient show what kind of problem? A, B, C, or D. 
So look at this one, it's very, the vital capacity is very low, right? Maybe only one liter over here. So this is showing there is a restriction of breathing. Okay, so restrictive problem. Okay, remember obstructive problem, the vital cavity is similar to the normal breathing, so like this. But for the uh, restrictive, the vital capacity is very, very low. It's okay, smaller than normal. Okay, so look at this picture over here. So this is very low PVC. Okay. This is restrictive for the obstructive. Is similar with the norm. Let's say four liter. This is four liter. Maybe this one only one or two liter. So this is restriction. The figure show three spirometry test results. Okay, so the left one and then A and B. Based on the size, shape, and approximate vital capacity, flow volume loop A. So just look at the loop A over here. Right? This patient show A, B, C, or D. So if you compare with the normal uh, flow volumes on the left side, then it is different. So there is something happens over here. But if you see the PVC are similar, the same, okay, it's maybe around four liter. But there is a going down over here. There is some obstructions over here. So this one is the obstruction or obstructive breathing, like asthma. Okay, so obstructive disease. So C should be the answer. Now look at this one. The figure show three spirometry test results. So this is coming from your experiment. The far left graph is normal. So A is normal. Based on the size, shape, and approximate vital capacity, flow, volume, loop C. So you just look for the C. This patient show what kind of problem? A, B, C, or D. And for C, it is restriction, a restrictive problem. Okay, because the PVC is very uh, low, less than four liter, less than normal. Your patient has below normal airflow. So below normal airflow so is going down like this. Yet uh, out of the lung. Yet a normal value of PVC or vital capacity is normal. So it looks like this. Okay. So this one is normal, maybe four liter. But this part over here, there is an obstruction. It's going down. Uh, which of the below lists that may be the underlying cause. So this is obstructive breathing eh, problems. And one example of obstructive disease is asthma. So this will be the answer. Which of the following may cause obstructive lungs disorder? The uh, obstructive, so degenerative muscle disease, drinking alcohol, lung prognosis, uh, smoking. Smoking can cause obstructions of breathing. Okay, so the answer will be smoking over here. Which of the following might cause restrictive lungs disorder? A, B, C, or D? Okay, of course, smoking, we already use this one for the obstructive, so this is not the answer. This one is also not bronchitis, it's kind of obstructive also, it's not restrictive. So the answer will be lung fibrosis.
in which structure does filtration of plasma to form filtrate occur. So we are moving from respiratory system to the urinary system now. Okay, so it's about kidney and other organs that filter our blood to produce the urine. So urinary system, okay, the main function is to filter the blood okay, to produce urine, which is waste product of our uh, presence in the blood. Okay, it will be released from our body. Okay, so what structure actually filter the blood? Of course, the structure is the kidney. Okay, so we have two kidney. And then from the kidney, the urine will go to the ureter. Okay, so kidney, ureter, two ureter. And it will store for a while in the urinary bladder. And from urinary bladder, there is a short tube. It's called the urethra. And it will be out from our body through this urethra. So part the organ that filter the blood is the kidney. In the kidney, we have special structure. It's called nephron. Okay, that look like this. Okay, so this is nephron. And the part of the nephron that filter the blood is this first part over here. It's called the, the glomerulus. Okay, so this is area of nephrons. Okay, and it has glomerulus to filter the blood. The rest will be tube. A okay, proximal tube, loop of Henle, and distal tube. So the one that really filter the blood is called the glomerulus. How are the results of a dipstick urinalysis determined? So this is the one that you perform on your lab experiment. We use the uh, dipstick urinalysis to check. Okay, the components of urine, which is normal or abnormal. So how you use that dipstick urinalysis, A, B, C, or D. So the dipstick urinalysis, there is a color. Okay? If the color change is telling you there is a specific uh, testing for specific substances that presence in the urine. So look for the uh, color. Okay, so osmometer, no, we don't use osmometer in the dipstick urinalysis. There is a dipstick reader, no, there is no reader for this dipstick. The dipstick observed under microscope, no, we do not use microscope for the urinalysis. So this change is a color change that we compare with standard. So there is a standard, okay, that usually located in the container of the dipsticks urinalysis, and you compare with your result. So this should be the answer. Urine is primary compost of A, B, C, or D. Okay, all of them is actually present in the urine, but which one is the most? Of course, the most components of urines will be water. In a fasting urine sample, which of the following is considered as abnormal? So this is abnormal finding. If you have this in urine, it means that you have problem with your uh, urinary system or maybe with the kidney. Which one is abnormal? Urea is normal. Okay, it should be there because urea is a waste product. Glucose, of course, is not. So glucose is something that should not present in the urine. If you have glucose, it means that you have problem with the urinary system. People that have diabetes, sometimes they have glucose 
uh, in their urine. So this should be the abnormal finding in the urine, okay, the glucose. All the of the following are considered abnormal. Okay, all of here is abnormal finding in the tissue, except so we actually looking for the normal component of urine. Okay? Which one is that? Glucose is abnormal, so it shouldn't be there. Protein should not be there. Red blood cell, you have problem if you have red blood cell in the urine. So the correct answer, the normal component of urine. Over here is the urea. Urea is a waste product that has to be released from our body. Which of the following would be a normal pH for urines? Okay, so normal pH of urine is from six to eight. It's considered as normal. Mostly it's kind of a little bit acidic, close to six. So this should be the answer. If you have very acidic, then you have problem. It's very alkaline, for example, 10, 12. You also have problem with the urinary system. So six to eight is the normal pH for urine. The presence of leukocytes, so leukocyte is white blood cell. So if you have leukocytes in the urine, it is indication of what? A, B, C, or D. Now you have to know the function of leukocyte or white blood cell is five. Infection, right? It means that if you have white blood cell in your urine, you have infection, which is urinary tract infection. The blank of an organism is the physical appearance resulting from the expression of the genes present. Okay, so we are moving from urinary system to the reproductive and genetics now. Okay, so this is part of your lab experiment, uh, inheritance, which is genetics. Okay, so the blank of an organism is physical appearance. So this is the one that you can see. Okay. So this is called what? Remember genotype, it means gene. Right? Genotype is a gene. You cannot see it because it is located in your chromosome, okay? inside your cell. So this genotype will be expressed as a physical character that you can see. Okay. So this physical character that you can see is called phenotype. Okay. So it can be can be observed at the phenotype. So this should be the answer, the phenotype. The blank of an organism is their genetic makeup. Okay, So this is the one that located in your cell. You cannot really see it, but this is what we call our gene. So this genetic makeup is also known as a genotype, usually symbolized with a letter. Like for example, people that have widow peak may be symbolized with this, okay? With these two alleles, okay? It should be uh, a combination of two alleles that work together to give our gene, okay? So this is genotype. An image of chromosome arranged in pairs by size and shape is called A. Okay, so we can take a sample from the cell and then take a picture of the chromosome. And then after that, arrange it based on size. Usually the biggest one, the biggest pairs will be pair number one. And then pair number two, and etc. until pair number 23, because we have 46 chromosome or 23 pair. So the pair number 23 is a sex chromosome, which is if we have different X 
and Y, then the individual is male. So this is pair number 23. So based on this information, then the shortest pair is actually pair number 22. Okay, this is the shortest chromosome. So this appearance or this arrangement of chromosome is also known as karyotype. Okay, it's over here. What is shown over here? Uh, remember, this is pair number one, uh, the, the longest one, pair number two, until the shortest one is pair number 23, uh, 22 over here. And then the pair number 23 is actually sex chromosome. If you see this is X and Y, so this individual or this picture is taken from male individual. Okay, boy or male. Okay, so this is what we call the karyotype. Okay, typing your chromosome. Alternate form of the same genes are called a genotype, genotype, karyotype, or alleles. So the genotype over here is shown by the combinations of alleles. Okay, the alleles will be uh, different. Uh, if it is capital letter, it is called the dominant allele. Okay. Then the other one, the opposite will be lowercase. This is recessive allele. Okay. So this genotype will always combination of these two alleles, whether both uh, dominant is called the homozygous dominant, okay, or maybe one capital letter, the other one is lowercase. This one is called the heterozygous, and maybe both of them are recessive allele. Uh, it is called the homozygous recessive. Okay, so this alternate forms of this gene is called the allele. So that's the answer. Okay, so allele is the alternate form of gene. What is the definition of an allele? A, B, C, or D. We just explain that allele is the alternative version of a gene okay, that determines the particular trail. So this should be the answer. What is the definition of recessive alleles? A, B, C, or D. Okay, so the recessive allele, so let's say here, over here. Okay, when they go together, the phenotype will be present. Like, for example, this lowercase allele is. Let's say W is for, you know, some people have this kind of hair type right, on the forehead. So this is called the widow peak. Okay. And other people, they have just straight hair like this. This is straight. Okay. So straight is actually caused by the recessive allele. It's only show up when the two alleles, the recessive alleles, come together. So lowercase w. Then you have straight hair. But for widow peak, it could be homozygous dominant or heterozygous like this. Okay. So these recessive alleles they will express as the recessive trait when they go together. So an allele whose tentative effect is expressed when present 
one or two copies is not the allele whose penetrative effect is only expressed when present two copies. So this should be the answer. What is definition of genotype? A, B, C, or D. We already mentioned that in the previous uh, ones. Hey, okay. question. It is the genetic makeup of an individual. It's called the genotype. So we cannot see it. It is inside our cell, but it can be ex expressed as a phenotype. So you see as a phenotype. So if you, this one over here, it is the phenotype, the expression of genotype. You can measure it, you can observe it. The allergic makeup of an individual is referred to as A, B, C, or D. Again, this is a makeup, it's a genetic makeup, allelic makeup is the same as genotype. Traits can be carried on X chromosome as said to be. So if it is traits only present in the uh, sex chromosome, okay, it's called the sex link, whether in the X chromosome or Y chromosome. Okay, both of them is called the sex link trait. Genes located on the X and Y chromosome are called, okay, we just explained that one, this is a sex link gene. The genotype PP, which is both dominant or capital letter, can be described as, so both the same, Therefore, it's called the homozygous. In this case, this one is homozygous dominant. Okay? If it is lowercase, okay, it's going to be homozygous recessive. So it is called the homozygous, the same, okay, the same allele. The genotype PP, which is both lowercase or both recessive allele can be described as, it's gonna be the same, this is still homozygous, but in this case is homozygous recessive. The genotype P and P, which is one is capital letter, the other one is lowercase, so it's different. So different mean hetero, hetero mean different. So this is heterozygous. Okay, so hetero mean different. Homo mean the same. Okay, now this is demonstration how you understand the gamete production during lab experiment. Okay? To demonstrate your knowledge of how to set up a Punnett square to represent a mating between a human female, which is X and X, so X and X will be female, and human male, which is X and Y, okay? indicate which of the following choices should be placed into the box indicated by the red arrow. Okay? So the first box over here on the top. Okay, so remember when it is X and X, then the gametes will separate. Right? One X will carry X chromosome and the other one will carry X chromosome because the same. Right? For the males, then the sperm, okay, is sperm will carry one X, and the other sperm will carry the Y chromosome. Okay, so like that. 
So this is the one that we're going to put on the planet square. Okay. So of course, the first one will be the first egg over here. Okay, and the other X will be also carry X chromosome. For the sperm, one carry X chromosome and one, the other one will carry Y chromosome. Okay, so when they combine together and Okay, so the first possible child will be male, the second, I mean female, eh? uh, daughter, so the other one will be daughter over here, and this one will be boy, and this one will be boy. So this year, the possibility of getting daughter is 50%, and having boy, or sons will be also 50%, so 50-50, okay? So that's the uh, question, uh, the answer for this question. So X chromosome, uh, X uh, chromosome will be carried on the first X of this female gametes. Now, how about this one? For the male. Okay, so indicates the error of his sperm. Remember, this is male. The first sperm will carry X, and the second sperm will carry Y chromosome. And in this table, you are ordered to put on the second one over here, which is going to be Y chromosome. Okay. So the first one is X, the second one will be Y chromosome. If a female was a carrier for sex links color blindness, what percentage of her male children would also be color blind? A, B, C. B or E, so 100%, 75%, 50% or 25% or maybe 0%. Okay, so color blindness is links in X chromosome. So it's mean that for normal female, okay, so normal female will be just like this. Okay, this is normal female okay there is no color blinds genes on it and then if the female is carrier one of them will carry the color blind gene so this is carrier uh, female and the female that have color blinds will be both of the x chromosome carry the color blind gene so this is a color blind female okay now how about male males only have two possibility the one that normal will be like this okay so normal male and the one that have color blind will be like this. So the color blinds will be located in the X chromosome. This is color blind male. Okay. Now the question is if a female was a carrier. So it means that this female over here, so this carrier female, okay, for sex links blindness, what percent of her male children would be uh, color blind. Male children. So let's say this 
carrier female married with a normal male, which is look like this. Okay. And you just combine the first X over here will be carrier daughter. So daughter that is carrier. The second one will be normal daughter. Okay. And the third possibility, if you combine this, will be boy that has color blind. And the last one will be this, which is normal boy. So the possibility of just boy over here will be 50% colorblind and 50% normal. So the answer should be 50%. If a male who is colorblind, and this is X link straight, has children with a female who is not colorblind and homozygous dominant. Okay, so the mattings uh, is like this. So it's a male who is colorblind. So it's going to be male colorblind will be like this. Okay, married with female homozygous dominant. So it does not carry the colorblind gene. So like this. Okay, what is the probability of their sons will be colorblind? Okay, look at this. So this is going to be daughter, which is carrier. Uh, we combine this. And then this with this will be normal boy. Okay. And then this with this one is all, also carrier daughter. And this, the last one over here with this, will be normal boy. So if you see, all the boy will be normal. Okay? So all the boy will be normal. So 100% normal boy. The question is, what is the probability of their sons will be colorblind? Because 100% normal, then it's going to be 0% colorblind. So no boy will be, or son will be colorblind. In humans, having dimples in cheek is a dominant trait. Okay, so you have dimple, it means that it's dominant trait. So we can put as a D. So you have dimple, maybe you are homozygous dominant. So it has dimple or maybe heterozygous, also dimple. Okay, the only one that do not have dimples will be the homozygous recessive, no dimple. Okay, if a child has dimples, but one, only one of the her, her parents does, uh, what are the genotypes of her parents? So the child has dimples. It means that the child here, okay? Because what? Because it said that one of only one of the parents have dimples. It means one parent is actually will be lowercase recessive. This is the the thing that we sure of here. Okay, one parent must be here. Okay, so that's the answer. Okay? One parent. This is the only one that we will know. If they don't have dimples, it means that it carry recessive alleles. Okay, so one parent will have no dimples. So will be this. the other parents, right? Maybe homozygous dominant or maybe heterozygous. It doesn't really matter. But the other parents should be lowercase, right? which which means that it does not have dimples. A male is heterozygous for a trait that produces freckles on the skin. And he has freckles if he marries a woman who is 
also heterozygous for fractals. Blank of the children will be fractals, and blank of the children will be heterozygous. Okay, so fractal is a dominant allele, so it's a capital letter F as a fractals. Okay, we're gonna put it here. So someone that have fractals maybe have this genotype. Okay, fractals or heterozygous is also fractals. The one that do not have fractals will be recessive. Okay, homozygous recessive, no fractals. Okay, so it say that male heterozygous. Uh, gonna be male heterozygous married with also female heterozygous like this. Okay, now we can put this in the Punnett square okay, to know the children, how it look like. Okay, so the first F over here, we're gonna, so let's say this is male and this is the female. So the top for female, the bottom for male. So we can put here, capital letter, and this one will be lowercase. This capital letter, this one is lowercase. Then we combine and these two gametes. So both gonna be capital letter, homozygous dominant. The next one will be heterozygous. The next one will be also heterozygous. Right? And the last one is the homozygous recessive. Okay, look at this combination. Well, the question is how many of the children will be fractal? Number one, fractal, number two, fractals, number three, also fractal. So three children fractal, and only one do not have fractal. So three to the one. So this is ratio for uh, phenotype. Okay, so phenotype ratio, three to the one. Now, how about the genotype ratio? Genotype ratio. So one FF, one homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, two heterozygous, and one homozygous recessive. So one to one. Okay. Now look at the question. Who is uh, of their children will be fractals? How many? Three to the one, which is seventy-five percent fractal. So this is the answer for the fractal. And how many of the children will be heterozygous? Two over here, which is fifty percent heterozygous. So this will be the answer. To inherit an autosomal recessive disorder requires a person to receive the disease causing allele from father only, mother only, both parent or none of them. So in order to get the recessive disease, like maybe uh, uh, color, uh, the, uh, Albino, so let's say albino. So albino is recessive uh, autosomal disease. So someone that have albino will have genotype, both of them lowercase a. Okay. So this lowercase a is only happening when one of uh, both of the parents carry this lowercase. Okay. So Maybe eh, the father is like this, the mother like this, then you will have these children. Or maybe the father like this, mother here, then you might also get this albino. Or if both parents albino, which is carry lowercase, then 100% children will be albino. So, this lowercase or recessive alleles should be coming from both parents. Okay, so one parent carry one lowercase allele or recessive allele. Okay, 
a blank is a tree like chart that shows a family history for a particular trait across several generations. So usually gonna be look like this. Male is square, married with a female circle. And then they have how many children? You can put it here, maybe boy, another boy, maybe girl, girl. And this girl married with males, and then they have girl or girl. Right? So this is the three like chart, and it is called the pedigree. Okay, so pedigree. Sometimes this chart can also put uh, if there's a disease, like say, oh, this father has disease, then it's shaded. Okay? So shaded mean. Uh, this individual carry the some traits, a specific trait that is shown in the specific trait pedigree. So let's say uh, this become shaded. Okay, so shaded individual is the one that carry specific trait for that specific pedigree. So again, this is called the pedigree. Okay, so like this. In a pedigree, an affected male would be designated by, okay, so remember, male is square. Okay, but it's called the affected, it means a specific trait that is looking for. Okay. So that specific thing that we're looking for will be given as a shaded area. So this is shaded male over here, is the one that have specific uh, or affected by specific disease or maybe characters or traits. A man and a woman have three children, all males. What is the probability that the next child will be girl? Okay, so remember again, this is man, XY, married with a female, which is XX. If you put it in the finite square, okay, this is for mother, this is for father. So going here, X and then Y, this one, X, X. So the children will be girl, girl, boy, boy. So 50% and 50%. Boy and girl. So it's always uh, it's all fifty percent, which is half. The major way that mysis two differs from mitosis is that A, B, C, and D. Remember, meiosis is the one that produces haploid cell. Okay, so haploid cell like eggs, sperm, okay, only carry half of parents' chromosomes. So that's the difference between mitosis and meiosis over here. So this is the haploid cell. A person who inherits an extra X chromosome will have like A, B, C, or D. So it means that they have 47 chromosomes. Okay? So the one that have extra is actually the sex chromosomes. Everything else is the same. So X, X, Y. Okay. So this type of Abnormality is called a klein felter syndrome. So what happened with this individual if they have extra eggs? It means that this individual will be boy okay? or male. Right? Because male, Y chromosome telling you this is male. So Y chromosome give male uh, sexual, uh, uh, male gender. However, this individual have extra X chromosome. Therefore, this male has more female characteristic. 
Okay, so basically this is male that act like a female. And this condition is called the Klein-Felber syndrome. So they have a syndrome of extra X chromosome. Okay, so this is a male okay, that has more female characteristics. Now, how about this one? A human female with only one X chromosome is said to have a condition called A, B, or C. So basically, this female only have 45 chromosome uh, or monosomy, and it's only carry one X, so X zero here. So one X sex chromosome only. So this one is gonna be female because you don't have the Y chromosome over here. So, but this female only have one X chromosome. It means that it's going to be less uh, female characteristic in this female. So this female will be look like a male okay? because less female characteristic. Okay. So this one is called the Turner syndrome. So Turner syndrome is a female that only have or carry one X chromosome. Therefore, she will have less female characteristic. Mostly, she will be uh, sterile, okay? Will not be able to have children. Okay, so, so this is not the answer. So it should be Turner syndrome. Okay, yeah. Next one. In human, if non Jensen even led to an individual with a genotype of XXY, they would A, B, or C. So it's happening, yeah. so especially on mother, if the X chromosome is not separate in the gamete formation, then there one of their children maybe have this genotype, which is XXY. We already mentioned this one is Klein-Felter syndrome. Okay, so these individuals are alive, okay? and it will be male okay? because it has Y chromosome. Okay, so this will be the answer. Okay, I think that's all for this exercise. Good luck with your lab uh, exam number two. Goodbye.